Hello and welcome to this edition of Fraud Talk, the ACFE's monthly podcast. I'm Emily Primo, Associate Editor of Fraud Magazine, and I'm joined today by Dr. Alexander Stein. Dr. Stein is founder of Dulles Advisors and a principal in the Boswell Group, and is an expert in human behavior and decision making. Dr. Stein advises executives and boards on psychologically complex leadership, culture, and ethics issues, and is a preeminent specialist in the psychodynamics of fraud, corruption, white collar misconduct, insider threats, and human factors in cybersecurity. He'll be a keynote speaker at the ACFE Fraud Conference Canada in Montreal, October 20th through the 23rd. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Stein. My pleasure, Emily. Good to be with you. Great. Okay, so to get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your career? Going all the way back, I actually began my life as a musician, uh, which may not seem relevant to the present, but in fact, uh, it, it was an early grounding in being able to listen uh, with particular acuity to all kinds of, in essence, abstract communications. Once I made the decision to pivot away from being a performing musician, I realized that I was deeply interested in the human condition and uh, went back to school and got a master's and a PhD in psychoanalysis and trained at an institute to become a clinical psychoanalyst and began my second professional career as a clinician in private practice treating patients. After a time, however, I made the decision to consider coming out of the consulting room to work with more impact, particularly focusing on business leaders and people in positions of influence and responsibility. And I started writing a column for Fortune Small Business Magazine on the psychology of entrepreneurship. Uh, which was very helpful in making that transition uh, more credible. Then a prominent fraud litigator, actually Martin Kenny, who won the Cressy Award uh, by the ACFE a number of years ago, uh, reached out to me as my reputation expanded, seeking my help in working with him and other members of FraudNet uh, to bring to bear a more sophisticated psychological understanding of fraudsters and their enterprises and to assist in the recovery of stolen assets and to be able to bring about a more effective conclusion to those matters for victims. And that was my initial introduction into uh, the world of um, people doing bad things in essence. Uh, And uh, from there, I expanded my uh, deliverable areas to include executive misconduct and other forms of uh, enterprise malfeasance. And a natural expansion to that has also been looking at people as the central element in cybersecurity. Uh, So as we progress, there's much more that I can say about all of those areas and how they uh, intersect and overlap. But uh, that really is the introduction. Great. So before we progress, what type of music did you play? <laughs> uh, I'm a pianist, and oh, okay. uh, I, I played a lot of Bach and Beethoven and Shostakovich and Brahms. Great. Just had to know, since that's kind of where you got your start. But to shift mm-hmm. back to the fraud element, you are a specialist in psychodynamics of fraud, What does this mean, really? And specifically, how can it be applied to our field of fraud fighting? Psychodynamics essentially suggests looking at the deep psychology of uh, how and why people behave as they do uh, or misbehave in the way that they do. Uh, And to bring to bear lenses and perspectives on what goes on inside people's minds Uh, that are vastly more complex than many of the behavioral models that prevail. And essentially to take a a deeper and more sophisticated approach to uh, looking at how things happen so that uh, certain kinds of 
crises events could can potentially be better mitigated, and then after the fact, uh, to be able to have a more expansive tool set to help in recovery efforts and to put in place uh, guardrails that might enable recurrence uh, from uh, happening. So kind of in that vein, uh, many white collar criminals are pretty unassuming. This is something that I noticed when I was doing research on some of the articles that you've written. And it's also something that we focus on here at the ACFE as well. Uh, They might be a trusted longtime employee at a small business or your reliable CFO. So how do we begin to spot the differences between ethical employees and malevolent ones? That is a question that immediately opens up into this uh, broad vista where we're talking about, you know, what actually is the difference between ethics or ethical behavior and malevolent behavior and Uh, What are the warning flags or the um, different kinds of indicators that people might be able to notice? And one of the reasons that that's so hard is because it's hard. Uh, Oftentimes, there really are no clear demarcations. It's not like you can actually superficially see uh, somebody who looks different or necessarily behaves differently. Um, And... It's not just that people uh, who commit white-collar crime may may be unassuming. Uh, It's a very normal way of existing. Everyone lies. Everyone evades. Everyone is deceptive in lots of different ways. And uh, oftentimes, unless we're talking about someone who is fundamentally a career criminal uh, or deeply involved in some form of organized criminality, if it's just somebody who is in a position within an enterprise, um, there can be any number of factors at play, both internal and external, to their workplace and even within uh, their own sense of what's going on that can trigger uh, an event or an episode. Um, so, you know, how, how to make a determination in advance is pretty tricky. Uh, and whether it's uh, trying to do some kind of um, you know, sort of ethical or behavioral audit of an organization or bolstering internal controls uh, or um, doing some form of hiring assessment, there are many subtleties and nuances that escape most forms of uh, early warning, psychometric testing, for example, or other kinds of personality tests, uh, typically will not capture the s- signs that people think that they should be able to see in advance. So moving on, you've said that you believe entrepreneurs and con men may share formative experiences. I found that to be really interesting. Uh, what, in your opinion, do they have in common? In a word, creativity. Uh, you know, I think we can easily talk about malicious creativity and uh, to consider what is it about the constitution of a person that he or she, although primarily we're talking about he, who will take uh, all kinds of entrepreneurial brilliance and a hunger for innovation and use it in destructive, socially destructive or non-legitimate ways rather than, you know, something that adds value to society or profits other people, shareholders or stakeholders. So, you know, where those two paths diverge uh, becomes really meaningful. Um, But before they diverge, uh, there are often a lot of similarities between creative people uh, in the ways that they launch ventures that do something for them uh, that's very important. And, you know, you were asking earlier about ethics and malice. So um, for better and for worse, one of the things that happens when you start to pare away the constraints of ethical behavior is you have a broader field 
uh, available to you. You know, basically, if there's no voice or no limit saying you shouldn't do that or you can't do this, uh, essentially it means you can do anything you want. And so you have a kind of creativity unrestrained there, um, which is one of the reasons why we often uh, find the good guys on their back foot uh, trying to figure out, well, uh, how do we get ahead of people who are doing bad things, you know? Who would have ever thought to put a bomb in a shoe, right? Or, you know, the ways in which we're often surprised uh, even by the remarkable innovation uh, of uh, how certain things can be weaponized that we thought were just perfectly normal. And, you know, it does take a particular almost artistic mind to be able to look at something usual and say, yeah, well, we can use that in a very different way, and I don't really care what happens if I do that, I'm just going to do it. You know, this is where those two kinds of unique characters intersect. And um, however, the results are obviously vastly different. So we need to be thinking just as we being fraud fighters need to be thinking just as creatively when we're trying to prevent fraud by saying, you know, this is how a criminal could exploit this system. Certainly. And um, that can be harder than it seems Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you just say it like that. You know, the idea of like, think like a criminal is is a a fairly well-established perspective, certainly in law enforcement for any, anybody who's looking to be able to uh, prevent uh, wrongdoing of some kind, you, you, you have to be able to think, uh, literally outside of the box, because you, you can be sure that your opponent uh, is not thinking within any boxes. You need every advantage that you, that you can get. Okay, so I'm actually going to shift gears a little bit for these last couple of questions and move toward the cyber uh, crime side. And first, starting more with kind of your um, analytic component, um, you've spoken about detecting bad actors using behavioral analytics. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Right. So um, actually, the the article that you're referencing was one in which um, I I was cited as uh, really a um, counter voice to the use of behavioral analytics. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a proponent of it, which is not to say that I'm antagonistic. Uh, to it. Um, I'm a big fan of technology and uh, data analytics uh, is is important and has its place. Um, My major concerns and my criticisms regarding the use of analytics is the ways in which um, it it generally oversimplifies massively complex systems. And and by those systems, I mean people, not the systems in, in which they are used that programming computer systems, let's say, to detect something about human behavior is much more limited than the people who are selling or buying these systems would want them to be or think they are. And so uh, there's a kind of false uh, security that is in place. It's not exactly security theater, um, but it really is m- much less comprehensive than uh, anyone would want it to be for many of the reasons that I've already talked about concerning the gap between understanding the complexity of human psychology and the way in which it gets rendered uh, in a very compressed sort of behavioralistic sense uh, mm-hmm. in technology. Uh, so, you know, um, w- 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 there are a whole lot of components to that, but in limited time, the one that I would isolate as probably the most significant is intentionality. So there, you know, it's very, very difficult even for other people, as we were talking about regarding, let's say, hiring um, or or looking at uh, an impending uh, malicious event to forecast really accurately what somebody is thinking and when they're going to be doing something. Uh, Oftentimes, People don't know 
uh, what somebody else is going to be doing until they're actually doing it. And at that point, you know, real time is Latin for too late. Uh, and this is a fatal flaw with analytics, which are predicated largely on the capacity to be able to uh, analyze all kinds of data clusters so that you can spot anomalous behavior or something like that. And yes, there may be something that will trigger a warning because it doesn't belong or there's some kind of variable that is anomalous. But nonetheless, it, it's not able at this point to understand what, what a person is thinking about and what the internal process is that will um, translate even thought into action. Yeah, and to expand on this a little bit more, and please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but um, are you basically saying that with these analytics, we fall into a trap of maybe putting a system in place and relying on that system to catch something? However, that system isn't living within our minds and doesn't know that a bad actor is considering doing something. That's exactly correct, and what you just said is not limited to technological systems. You know, what, you, what you just stated really is a perfect summary of many of the flaws uh, or deficiencies is probably a, a better word in most fraud mitigation practices, so that there's a notion that there are certain things that you should be able to see or know or do and if they're constructed and executed on perfectly, uh, that it will create an airtight system uh, or a bulletproof system that will prevent something. And that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sounds as if I'm being like extremely pessimistic <laughs> in everything that I'm talking about here. Like, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. And it's not my intent really to be quite so negative, but, but rather to shine a bright light on uh, how much harder this all is uh, than people would like to think. And that by and large, my recommendation uh, as, as kind of an overlay to everything is that any organizational system, if it's truly serious about uh, looking to mitigate uh, threat actors of various kinds, um, has to have a system that's designed to account for the realities of human behavior and, and really have um, redundancies and shock absorbers uh, for that built into it rather than to architect um, threat mitigation or, or defense systems that um, sound wonderful but really would only work if people cooperated perfectly with them, and that's just not what's going to happen. Okay. I feel like this leads in nicely to because, you know, we're one of those organizations, those associations that's that's looking to stamp this out. And so here at the ACFE, we teach about prevention being a much more successful and more cost effective tool than detection in the fight against fraud. So in your experience and opinion, how can fraud examiners more successfully spot insider threats to their organizations before fraud becomes expensive and detrimental to the company? Well, if I can continue uh, along the path of being uh, really, really darkly pessimistic here, I, I, I don't think that trying to stamp it out is going to succeed. Fraud is a, a part of human interaction. And um, you know, I, I, I think that if we were to ever find a way, in a sense, to inoculate against it or to eradicate the impulses that give rise to it, what we would be left with is not really something that we would be happy with, ultimately. Um, so, you know, we have other choices besides you know, complete eradication, and, and it involves what you're asking for, which is how can we treat of this more effectively? Uh, one of the ways is actually to take more realistic stock of who people are. And not every um, uh, ACFE member necessarily needs to have uh, deep and extensive training and expertise in psychology, uh, but it certainly would be recommended, I think, to advance what you're asking about, which is, you know, how can uh, all fraud fighters of various uh, types do better at helping to um, 
prevent these kinds of things from happening is when they're deployed into an organization to be able to know and think about things that are really outside their professional domains and not to minimize or dismiss them because they don't understand or because they don't think it's relevant or because they don't think it's really important. There's nothing that's unimportant in the way that people think and behave. And, um, you know, often it's the minutest, uh, seemingly innocuous detail that actually becomes the critical thing. And um, helping people at least to raise not just their awareness, but their attention and their capacity to take notice of things that don't relate to, you know, let's say spreadsheets or um, transaction details or other hard commercial elements of something that could be evidence of uh, criminality or some form of wrongdoing, but really to be able to pay very, very close attention to the nuanced human dimension uh, will go a very long way. Okay, great. So just to finish us off, is there anything that you uh, would like to cover that I may not have asked, maybe something in the cyber realm um, before we go? I appreciate your asking. I, I think I actually made the strongest point just then uh, that I can, and, and that it relates not just to members of the ACFE and other fraud fighting professionals, but really people in positions of influence and responsibility and decision making uh, at the tops of their organizations or the divisions and business lines that they head, um, as well as uh, other affiliated professions who are engaged in uh, doing what they can, whether it's in uh, information security or compliance and ethics or um, human capital management, uh, to learn more and be more attentive to uh, the complexities of who people are and what goes on with people in organizations. And that uh, one of the worst things that we can do, and actually one of the uh, ways in which we all end up uh, enabling wrongdoing is by um, oversimplifying uh, and pushing things to the periphery and suggesting, well, it can't happen here, or, or we've done everything we need to, or this really isn't important, and, and all of the different ways that we have uh, and that people use every day for minimizing or avoiding lots of things that are very, very challenging. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much for speaking with me today, Dr. Stein. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Remember, you can find more episodes of Fraud Talk at acfe.com slash podcast, the iTunes store, or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Emily Primo signing off.